And that's what we desire today. The presence of the Holy Spirit to be in our lives. We are continuing in the book of Romans. Uh, we were in chapter 8 last week. We'll be in chapter 8 again this week. We're going to pick up, though, about verse 12, chapter 8, verse 12. And I think we're probably going to go, uh, the text that we're kind of be focusing on is 12 to 25, really. 12 to 25. And... As we look at this text, we think about the fact that uh, what God is calling us to today, what kind of life that God is calling us to. <clears throat> Years ago, a story was told uh, that uh, Gandhi was on a train and it was about ready to leave and it started moving and he lost one of his shoes. It fell off and uh, there was no way to retrieve it. So he took his other shoe off and threw it close to the shoe that he'd lost. And somebody asked him, what, what, do you do, what did you do that for? And he said, well, I couldn't retrieve my shoe, but the poor soul that finds that shoe will now have a pair that they can use. And what today I think what Paul is really doing is allowing us to step into his shoes, or more specifically, into God's shoes. So I want to talk a little bit about what it means to step into God's shoes today. Some big shoes to feel. Um, but first of all, as we look at this, we want to talk about what the Christian life is all about. And that's really what he's saying here. And the first thing, if you're taking notes here, is that it's a holy life. And that's in verses 12 to 14. It's a holy life. He says in verse 12, Therefore, brethren and sisters, we are debtors. We're in debt, he says. Um, sometimes we think that we've heard the saying, you owe it to yourself. Well, actually, we owe it to God. But we're not in debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. So, Paul is saying just the opposite of what the world says. The world says, you owe it to yourself. You deserve it. But the Bible sometimes goes countercultural. And he's saying here, it's not that you're indebted to yourself, to the flesh, to do all the things you want to do. To don't worry, be happy at all costs. That's not the message of the Bible. The message is this. We're not in debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. Because he says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Very simple there. If we do everything that makes us happy, if we do everything that we want to do, that's a destructive lifestyle. We all know. Just imagine if we told our children, just do whatever you want to do. How would that work out? But we know that we have to guide our children and, and keep them safe and all that. <clears throat> the Christian life is no different. That if we do everything we want, if we uh, you know, if live the way we want, and, and I see people all the time who you can look at them and, and, and tell that they are they're used to doing some hard living. You know, I, uh, I see people that I went to school with or people the same age as me in the hospital. And I, when they tell me their age, I think, man, I hope, I, I hate to say this, but I'm thinking to myself, do I look that bad? Do I look that old? You know, and, and it's obvious that the kind of lifestyle that they lived have contributed to really the, the it shows on the outside. And so he, he's saying, if you live after the flesh, that's death. That's not living. We watched a show the other night. You guys have seen the, the shows of intervention and, and, and how that this individual, this person, young, beautiful woman, the prime of her life, because she was messed up inside, began uh, drugs and how it was destroying her life, her relationship with her mother, her relationship with her child. She lost her child. That's a picture of a life that does whatever they want. That's a picture of a selfish life, as we've said before. 
if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And, uh, you know, the, the idea of putting to death. Paul said, uh, the old man is dead. The old man is dead. And so there, there's a change. And this is not something, uh, when we think about it, it's not something we do on our own. We need help with this. He says in verse 14, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. And so an evidence that you know God, that you're a child of God, is that you're being led by the Spirit of God, which means that, again, that you're doing things that would be pleasing to God. I wrote down a quote um, Yesterday, we went down to the farmer's market and, and uh, get some produce. And Mark said something that, that kind of stuck with me a little bit. And, and it's not that far off from what John Wesley has said. But he said, I, I thought about your sermon last week. And, and you know, sometimes I, I know that when I, when I do a sermon, I, I, I kind of, uh, in order to make a point, I may overstate something. But Jesus did sort of the same thing, didn't he? He would use hyperboles and, and he would talk about if your right eye offended you, cut it out and cut off your left hand or whatever. Uh, not that you would take that literally, but in the sense that we understand it. And he said the point of the sermon was basically this. Judge less and make sure I get this right. Judge less and love more. I thought, you know what? That's exactly it. Judge less and love more. Well, if we could just, all of us, just make that a commitment that if we're going to try to do that, every one of us, whether it's social media, whether it's face to face, whatever, judge less, love more. John Wesley said this. He said, we should be rigorous in judging ourselves and gracious in judging others. I think that's true. Jesus said something similar that, you know, it's, you know, we're, we're always looking at the thing in somebody else's eye, the beam or the, the, the log in someone else's eye. And we don't even see or the splinter. He's talking about a small speck in someone else's eye, but we don't see the log in our own eye. And that's really what he's talking about. So what is holiness? Well, I understand it, uh, you know, from a, a Wesleyan perspective. And I, I had some classes on, uh, actually I had one, one class that was J John Wesley's theology, the whole class. I loved it. But here's the thing. You don't have to be a Methodist to be able to understand holiness. It's not a Methodist concept only. It's a biblical concept. It's from the scriptures. Holiness is not something that the Charismatics or the Pentecostals come up with or the Methodists. It comes straight from the Bible. But, uh, having said that, uh, the Methodists have done a really good job of really expounding that. For those of you, if you've ever been on a walk to Emmaus, which I highly recommend, we don't have any in our area, but on the walk to Emmaus, they break down all the, the uh, really the talks of holiness and sanctification. And they talk about justification. They talk about sanctification. And they break it down in very simple layman terms. But let me tell you what Wesleyan uh, holiness is really grounded in. And first of all, it's grounding in the teachings of, of the Bible. Uh, but it, it, Wesleyan coming from John Wesley. Wesley and his brother, um, as you know, were part of the Anglican church. And uh, Methodism spread from that. They started having small groups. They call them the holy clubs. And about the same time, people began to call them Methodists, that they were very methodical. And then maybe it was a term to make fun of them, but it kind of stuck. It stuck with them. And they began to be called Methodists, and even today. But here's basically Wesley's doctrine of holiness. Now, it was known also as a doctrine of Christian perfection. That used to be a popular term. It's not used quite as much because when we think of perfection, we think of someone that doesn't make mistakes. And that's really not what Wesley was saying. 
But the doctrine of Wesleyan or biblical holiness is this. Here's what Wesley taught, first of all, the doctrine of original sin. Not everyone believes that. But the doctrine of original sin basically says that when Adam sinned, he fell, then all of us, and that sin's been passed down, we're all sinners. The Bible says none of us are good. All of us sin and come short of the glory of God. And so we sin by choice, but we're also, we've inherited the seed of Adam and Adam's race. So that when we're born, David said, in sin I was shapen into iniquity. And if we think about the fact that we really don't have to teach our children to lie, do we? We don't have to teach them to be selfish. What do we have to teach them? We have to teach them to share. I mean, we never have to go up and say, now little Johnny, you're sharing too much. The next time you keep the ball yourself. Or you keep the pie yourself. We have to teach them to share. We have to teach them not to lie. We have to teach them not to steal. Because it's born in her. It's part of our nature. The Bible says that uh, we've all gone astray and that, that there's none good. No, not one. And that inherited nature, that inherent nature that the songwriter sung about, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. It's in all of us. That nature that we follow or if we choose to follow, will take us down the wrong path. So the doctrine of original sin is that we're all sinners. But not only that, it affected the entire creation. Look what he says in, back in the passage there. He says that the entire creation is groaning. And, and he, he talks about the fact in verse 19, <coughs> excuse me, that the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same hope, the same in, in hope. In other words, subject to vanity, after Adam sinned, God was obliged to subject the creation to uh, the entire world was cursed, entire universe. And so even creation is waiting for that day of hope. And so they've all been affected. So when Adam sinned, we all felt that, even the earth. And, you know, we talk about saving the earth and we ought to be very diligent about uh, you know, being conscious of the environment. I think that's a Christian thing to do. But the reality of it is, we're not going to save the earth. God's going to save the earth. He's going to recreate. That doesn't mean we don't do our part now to make it better, because we can do some things. So, the point is that the, the doctrine of original sin really teaches that we were all affected, and even the universe. Number two, Wesley taught that salvation or justification is by faith alone. This is very important. Wesley taught that salvation was by faith alone. He dismissed the notion that good works can really create any merit on our own. That the works that we do, however good they are and we should do, do not... Uh, really contribute to our salvation. We're saved unto good works, but our good works don't save us. So many people get that backwards. And Wesley taught that it's by grace through faith alone that we are saved. Justification, again, we talked about this Wednesday night. Justification means to be declared righteous. You're not justified because you did anything right except you accepted Christ. You're justified because He has declared you righteous through the blood of Jesus. End of story. But, yes, we serve Him, we love Him, and we want to please Him. So, that's part of, this is the third part of what Wesley, Wesley taught. He taught that genuine faith produces inward and outward holiness. Genuine faith will produce inward 
and outward holiness. Uh, Wesley understood perfection in these terms. It was a, a, mature, a, a maturity of character and an ever-increasing love for God. When Wesley talked about Christian perfection, he was talking about becoming perfect in love. That the more mature you became as a Christian, the more closer you got to God, the more you begin to love God, you, the more you would love others, and your life would show it. There would be inward and outward holiness. That's what holiness is all about. So what happens is that when you get it inside, it begins to affect the outside. And everything you do, and you begin to love God. A selfish life is an unholy life. A holy life is a life that seeks for others and the good of others. And so, the Christian life is a holy life. Number two, the Christian life is a happy life. That's what he's really saying in verses 15 through 18. He says in verse 15, For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So two things are, talk, are going on here. First of, all, first of all, God has chosen us. And adoption is the idea of being chosen. We didn't just happen to be. God chose us before the foundation of the world. Secondly, God, uh, we're born as children of God. We're born into the God family. So we're, we're chosen and born. And as children of God or as adopted children, we receive all of the things that God has. That's what he says. If children, then what? Heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, that be that we suffer with him, that we may also reign with him or be glorified together. And so the idea there is that as children of God, we, we have this wonderful truth to know that we are His children and we receive His blessings in our lives. And that ought to make us happy. Now, that doesn't mean that when you become a Christian, all your troubles go away. You know, if you, if you get saved in jail, you're still in jail. You know? But, at the same time, you can have an inward happiness even though you may out things around you may not be going quite the way you'd like them to be. That's what the happy life is. You know, when he talks about in Psalm 1, blessed is a man or happy is a man that walketh not after the, you know, the, the citizen of the sea or the scornful and all that. Because we, we live in a happy life. We're children of God. And we know this. And, and you know, the thing about being a Christian is when you begin to live an unselfish life and live a holy life, you will no longer want to just live for yourself because that's a miserable life. And so many people today uh, are, are miserable because they only think of themselves. And when you begin to look at what you can do for others and your life becomes an others-centered life, you'll be so much happier. So much happier. So the Christian life is a holy life, but it's also a happy life. I never knew what happiness was until I came to Christ. And I began to serve God. And even in the deepest, darkest times of my life, even in those times when I've lost people in my lives that I loved, having that sweet Holy Spirit with me and to know that I'm a child of God, there's, some, there's a joy there that you can't understand. That, that's just The Bible says it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's something that you can't even put into words. But I, I, I just, I knew that when I came to Christ and I could just go through life and know that God is with me and I'm a child of God. No matter what other people think about me, I am a child of God. And some may, people may look at you and say, well, you're this or you're that. And they may label you one thing or another. But you remember this. Listen to this if you don't hear anything else. Remember this. I am a child of God. And you say that and you remember that every day of your life. No matter what other people think, I'm a child of God. And that'll make a difference in your life. So it's a holy life. It's a happy life. But also it's a hope-filled life. 
It's a hope-filled life. Look what he says in verse 19 to 25. He says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What are they waiting for? What are we all waiting for? It's that expectation and that hope of redemption. He says in verse 20, The creature was made... Uh, subject to vanity, not willingly, but by a reason of him who has subjected the same in what? Hope. Because the creature itself also, also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That's not happened yet. Verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now, I've never had children, so I, I can't say I know what this is like. And I don't want to know what it's like. But apparently there's some pain involved, right? There's some groaning involved. Now, especially in the days when they didn't have the medicine that we have today. But what he's saying is there, there's a little bit of groaning in, in the whole universe, waiting for the redemption and the coming of the Lord, when all things will be made right. He said, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit and the redemption of of our body. So here's what we must understand that we get saved and we're saved by grace through faith and our spirit and our soul is okay, but our bodies are still part of the dust, they're still sinful. And we're still waiting for that. And, and, and we understand what Paul, as we back up to chapter 7 and 8, when he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ. Now, here he's talking about it. Our bodies are, are waiting for that redemption. Oh, so many times we, we want to do what's right and we, we fly off the handle and we say the wrong thing or we do the wrong thing or whatever. <laughs> but he said our body is groaning for that. And then verse 24, an interesting statement. He says, for we are saved by what? Say it. Hope. We're saved by hope. What is that saying there? We're saved by hope. Not the idea of uh, wishful thinking, but the idea that if you have hope, you have a reason to get out of bed every morning. If you have hope, you have a reason to go forward and take that next step. If you have no hope, you don't want to get out of bed. But the Christian is saved by hope. And he says that we're saved by hope but hope that is seen is not hope. If it's there, you can see it. For what a person seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we do not see, then with patience we wait for it. And then he talks about how the Spirit prays sometimes for us, as Samantha was talking about. But the Christian life is a hope-filled life. It's the idea of knowing that it's going to get better, that this isn't going to be forever, that this isn't it, that the worst thing is not the last thing. And we understand that, that God has a plan for us that goes far beyond this life. And every day we can look up and say, God, I'm taking a step out of, <laughs> on, by faith, knowing today that you have a plan for my life far beyond this life. That's hope. Sometimes things may seem hopeless, but they're not. When we look at this world today and we see all the fighting and the violence and, and all of the things and pandemics and it seems like everything at once has just been unleashed and we feel like, is there any hope today? And many people wonder if there is any hope. But there is hope in God. I promise you. There's always hope. There's always hope in God. 
And we must keep that in mind. As long as we have hope, we can keep on going. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. And I hope today that you understand that it's not all finished yet. That, that, that we're waiting for that wonderful day when we shall be saved. But please understand this. That if you know Christ, if you have this inward holiness, that it will come out and it will show. It will reveal itself. They shall know we are Christians by our love. One time a lady was downtown and she saw a little boy in the street standing on a grate next close to a bakery. He had no shoes. It was a very cold and terribly windy winter day. And she went up to this little boy and said, where are your shoes? And he looked down and said, I don't have any shoes. And notice they didn't have much of a jacket either. She said, come with me, we'll take care of that. She takes him down to the department store and buys him a new pair of shoes and a nice warm jacket. Takes him to the bakery and gets him something to eat. And he's so excited when they finish that he takes off a run and he can't wait to go home and tell his parents about his new shoes and this wonderful lady. And then all of a sudden he stops in his tracks and he runs back to her and said, I forgot to ask you, are you God's wife? <laughs> She said, no, I'm not God's wife. I'm just a child of God. He said, I knew you were related. I think the world will know that we're related by our love. They all know we are Christians by our love. I'm going to ask the musicians to come as we bow our heads. Do we bow our heads today if there's anyone here that needs the prayers of this church? Maybe you don't feel holy today. That's okay. We're all there. We're all in this body struggling together. Maybe you don't have a lot of hope that you once had. And maybe you're not that happy. I want to ask you if you just raise your hand and say, pray for me. I need the prayers of this church. God bless the hand. Anyone else? Let's pray. God, today, life is filled with struggles, and trials, tribulations, Lord. And the Christian is not exempt from those things. Lord, I know that sometimes we can find ourselves in the valley of discouragement. And I just want to pray for everyone today. God, let them know how much you love them and that they are children of God. And may that truth begin to seek in that they will see their worth not from their parents or not from their spouse or not from anyone else, but they would see their worth in God. God, thank you that we can declare that we're children of God and that we have all this wonderful, wonderful, all these wonderful rewards and this promise of deliverance from you. Bless them, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.